Thank you for being here this morning. Good to welcome you all into this beautiful day and this nice, cool, no, yeah. auditorium. <laughs> We're making progress on the building, though, and uh, then we'll get the air conditioners back in probably uh, sometime in December. Maybe the air conditioners <laughs> will work. Well, I'm looking forward to this morning. Are you? It's been an interesting week. Aren't there, haven't there been a lot of interesting weeks recently? Just never quite sure from day to day what's happening and what's going on, except God is still on the throne. Amen. Now, I made a mistake this morning. I didn't get the call to worship printed out for me. So I'm standing up here waiting. There we go. Call to worship this morning. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. Think of that, will you please? In the midst of whatever is going on that may bug you, and if you're not bugged, some these days, uh, would you do a little experiment for me? Kind of stretch out your left arm like this. Take these two fingers and put it right about here, just to make sure. Because if there's nothing that's bugging you these days, you're either a super saint, which you all may be. But remember, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. That's our God. That's the hope, that's the promises that we have. I'm looking forward to this service. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Some of you asked if we had to sneak across the border. We didn't. I can say that publicly on the internet. Um, no order of that kind has come down me just yet that I know of. But we're here. We're glad to be here because we trust in the Lord and we must remember if we trust in Him, we can't be shaken. I get a little nervous at times. But our God, the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. So let's enjoy the celebration today. Let's be together in the spirit. God help us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer this morning thanking you for your mercy, for your abundant blessings, for your grace, for your love that shines and shows in our lives. And now, God, as we worship you in this time together, be with us in a special way. May your will be done as we worship you. And help us to hold on to the fact that you surround us and you will not be shaken forevermore. Therefore, we need not fear. You're in charge. Thank you. Amen. Dan? Well, you know, you keep bringing up verses that we can sing about, but we just can't seem to get out of the right page. Because there's a verse or a song that we sing I will not be shaken, right? Yep. We sing that song and we sing scripture. Isn't that a cool thing? Yes. Amen. Well, hey, I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad you posted something on Facebook today. Today is your wife's birthday. That's right. And so those of you who are on Facebook, you can say happy birthday to Sharon. I don't believe Sharon has a Facebook page. No, she doesn't. But you can wish her a happy birthday on Facebook and then her husband will show her. How's that? And we have a card. So I'm going to run off camera here. Give you your card. Amen. Happy birthday. 
Thank you for playing today, too. <laughs> Marilyn and uh, Sharon, the dynamic duo, are playing today. So, hey, are you happy to be in church today, even though it's almost 90 degrees? That when I left my house at 8 30, it was like 88, it's according to the. Uh, I said, I'm wearing dress pants today because they're cooler. And Zach's like, well, why don't you just wear shorts? And I said, I'm leading music. That's why I'm not wearing shorts. <laughs> I draw the line at no socks. <laughs> Let's sing this great song, I Have a Hope. See, I promised you last week we would sing this song, right? Maybe next week I'll promise to say, we'll sing, I Will Not Be Shaken. Okay? Okay? I like it. If you want to stand, stand. If you want to sit because it's hot, if you're in air conditioning and you want to stand, that's be great. So let's sing. I have a hope, I have a future, I have a destiny that is yet awaiting me, my life's not over, a new beginning's just begun, I have a hope, I have this hope, God has a plan, it's not to harm me, but it's to
all this was well with our soul. Have you been there? Can I get a witness? But you know what? That third verse is the best verse. My sin, and then the writer stops. Oh, the bliss of this glory. He just has to soak it all in. The bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not just a little bit of it, but the whole thing is nailed to his cross. And I don't have to look at it anymore. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. It is well with our soul. Above all kings, above all powers, above all wisdom, above everything, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Amen. As we prepare our hearts for prayer, we have a number of things to, uh, to thank God for. We have a number of things that he's already aware of them, but we want to verbalize them to him. We want to remember Tom Dunbar, who is uh, currently infirm and in a rehab stay, and we want to remember him and I know that the Lord is with him, but we want to just pray blessings upon Tom and his wife. Yeah. And uh, I know there are other people around in this uh, area that we have many things that we should probably let the Lord know about. But uh, and I miss this time. I miss to say, hey, our altars are open, but right where you're at, our altars are open. You can stand, you can be seated, you can turn around and kneel. I, I'll look at the back here. It doesn't matter to me. But above all powers, above all kingdoms, above all thrones, He is our rose, trampled on the ground. Amen? Amen. Let's sing. Above all. Heavenly Father, the thought, the thought that we just expressed, said in the midst of your suffering on a cross for us, you thought of us. Lord, we come today as a group of needy people. Lord, uh, 2020 hasn't really gone exactly like we thought it might. But Lord, you have been faithful you have ministered to each of us in our needs. And we thank you for that. God, uh, today we are gathered here in your name. And 
in just a, a few minutes, in response to your command on the night that you were betrayed, we are going to together, both here in this church building and wherever people are watching at home or wherever they may be watching, we're going to gather around your table. We're going to share together in the Lord's Supper. And as we do that today, God, I for one am going to be very mindful of the words of another song that we sang. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control. Let Christ as regarded my helpless estate and has shed your own blood for my soul so that we can lift our voices in the midst of uncertainty, in the middle of questions, in the middle of change and we can still say it is well with my soul and Lord haste the day when my faith shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound. The Lord will descend. Even so, it is well. Lord, for those who are here, or those who are watching by means of the internet, for those where at this particular moment in time, uncertainty and doubt is more prevalent than certainty and faith. And Lord, that's okay. But I pray that even as we pray together today and as we open your word and as we share in the Lord's Supper, I ask Dear Lord, that you would cast aside our doubts and help us to see you more clearly. And may we be able to rise in our affirmation of you to say with certainty that you are here that you are with us, that you are surrounding us with your protection forevermore. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, I pray. Before we conclude the prayer, for those of you who are here in the building when you came in, you were handed a cup that includes both the juice and the wafer. If your eyes are open and you're watching me, don't do that. I got the wafer off. Got to get it open. Which doesn't look like I'm going to be able to do. Oh, there it comes. We gather together today in the name of Jesus. Without his name, without him, there would be no reason whatsoever for us to be together. But because in the night that he was betrayed, 
he gathered with his disciples and ate the Passover meal with them. And then after supper, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and distributed it to them and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And for over 2,000 years, when people gather in his name, they celebrate together with the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Today we hold in our hand an element representing the broken body of Jesus Christ, may we partake together. Likewise, after supper, Scripture records that Jesus took the cup. And he said to his disciples, this, this is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood. This is my blood which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For, he said, for as often as you do this, you show the Lord's death until he comes again. Lord, we're looking forward to your coming again. and We just can't help but believe that it may be sooner than some of us think. It could be any time now. But Lord, we want to show our love for you by partaking together. Shall we do Dear Lord, we're going to take some time now and look into your word. Bless in this part of our service. Lord, be with those today. Dan mentioned Tom. We pray for him, Doris. We pray for others of our church family been thinking this week of those that, uh, that find themselves in nursing homes today. They weren't there at the beginning of this year. Pray that you would go to them. Be with them. Lord, teach us from your word. In your name I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles close by or your telephone with the Bible on it or whatever, turn to the book of Acts, the second chapter. And I don't have on the slides this morning, uh, at least not at this part, We'll refer back to them again later in the service, but uh, I want to read from Acts, the second chapter, uh, verses 42 through 47. If I were to title my, my message today, it would be, Where the Spirit of God Comes, Christian Community Breaks Out. The second chapter of Acts is the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to those 120 in the upper room. And everything changed with that day. Uh, verse 42 is not exactly about that day, but the following days. And I just want to get this kind of in, the, in our thinking. Talking about the believers. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I, uh, I think I've mentioned in recent weeks, we're at that point in my tenure as the interim pastor that we don't know exactly how long I may be still here. Uh, and I don't mean I'm about to die. That's not the, that, of course, we all understand that's part of life. But uh, I, I've been thinking, when I first came uh, many months ago now, I, I preached a number of messages from the book of Acts. And I, I think that I probably uh, will, will focus on the book of Acts in the next few Sundays anyway, again. And you might say, well, why, why would you want to focus on the book of Acts? Well, uh, a number of reasons. The book of Acts tells the story of the early days of the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's always good for us to reflect on the early days of the church. Because we need to be like the early church. Uh, secondly, the book illustrates different types of churches. I, I will say a little more about this but, uh, in, in a few minutes, but there are, uh, there are people who say in, in our world today, I just want to be a part of a church like the early church. And my response to that is, okay, which one? Uh, the one in Corinth? Well, let's be honest. If you read the book of 1 Corinthians, I'm not sure I want to be a part of that church. So God used them in spite of, well, you read the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, the book of Jerusalem? Well, yeah, that's where the action was, or at least they thought that's where. The, you understand what I'm saying. But the book of Acts illustrates different types of churches. A couple of weeks ago, I preached about the church at Antioch. And, and one, of the, one of the sterling facts about the, the church at Antioch was, well, you might have a different idea, but one of the things I mentioned a couple of weeks ago was the church at Antioch, it's recorded, this was primarily a Gentile church, but it was the place where first the followers of Jesus Christ were called Christians, which, which technically means little Christ. Oh, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all be part of a church that uh, somebody would say downtown, well, what do you know about that church of the Nazarene up there on Crawford in Madison? And someone who didn't know a lot about us would say, well, I don't know a lot about them, except I do know some of the people that go there, and they represent Christ very well. Whew. Wouldn't you like that? Sure. So, it's a good idea to, to study other churches. The, the, the book of Acts also illustrates the ways to deal with change. Uh, change including conflict and unrest and uncertainty. Uh, let me let me remind you that uh, we are we are now having Zoom meetings on Wednesday night, and I try to send out an invitation to everybody that I have your email address for, and. Uh, this past Sunday night, or Wednesday night, when we met, there, there weren't many of us, but there were four of 
us all together and we have a good time. And uh, I, I have been downstairs in our home and uh, one of my tasks right now is to take my library out of boxes and put it on shelves. I have a fairly extensive library. Uh, my mother was a hoarder, and uh, we have National Geographic magazines, or whatever you call them. We don't, we don't have every one for every year, but I unpacked some this past week that have a date on them of 1937. We have a, a lot of them. Uh, in the 40s, more in the 50s, several, a few in the 60s, and then we subscribe for a while, and we, I don't know what I'm going to do those, with those. I'd like to sell them all, but uh, we've looked on eBay, and you can get maybe a buck a piece. Well, at least that'd be ten dollars, so, you know. <laughs> but but I, was, I, was, I was trying to get some books unpacked, and a few years ago, in the late 90s and early, what is the 2000, in the early aughts? Well, anyway, in the early 2000s, in the late 1900s, there was a series of books put out by uh, what's now called the Foundry on, uh, on leadership. All the books were edited by uh, a pastor named Dale Galloway and several other great authors, and I, I, I put that, I think I have eight or nine of the books of that series, uh, put those on a shelf together, and I was, I was struck by, they're all about leadership, and I was struck by the title of one, which was Leadership During Change. <laughs> and I thought, I wonder if there's anything in here about how to, how to lead a church in the middle of a pandemic. I haven't looked yet, but uh, the book of Acts is saturated with stories about what the Holy Spirit does in the life of the church. So we're going to be spending some time there, and, and here now is a question, uh, a question that I have asked before. But perhaps from a little different standpoint here, uh, what kind of a community is this church in? What kind of a community do you live in? And, and I look out and there are not a lot of us here this morning, but I'm glad you're here. And hi, folks on the, the internet, we're glad you're here too. And, and I see people here who, well, I see one right there. She lives in Illinois. Oh, yeah, but I do too. And, and I see people who live here in Baraboo. I pe see some Reedsburg folks. I see people way out there in Laval. And, and uh, we have individuals that are part of this church family that live in the Dells and all over this area. What kind of community do we live in? What, in fact, what kind of, what kind of community surrounds this church building? kind of interesting, you wouldn't want to go, I mean, you wouldn't want to designate what kind of community this is by just driving up the street to the dead end. Because you'd be confronted with the fact that when you get there, the community's kind of dead. Right? Think about it. Come on. <laughs> Smile at me. For those of you who don't know this area, there's a cemetery up there. And, and you don't have to go very far to the north to see a very different kind of community that appears to be a very affluent area, uh, a very exclusive, perhaps, or maybe an inclusive neighborhood, maybe deteriorating. Uh, 
maybe a covenanted community, or there might even be, a, I don't know, are there any gated communities in this area? Well, we've discovered recently, if you watch the news at all, that you really don't want to live in a gated community in St. Louis because you might get charged with a felony if you're trying to protect all like I'm good. <laughs> what kind of community is this? What kind of community? Well, we can spend a lot of time discussing that, talking about it. But uh, we need, you need as a congregation, we need to understand the communities in which we live. Now, let me give you a little bit of hope. Uh, let me ask this question. What kind of community is this church? And I'm not saying where are we in the community. What kind of community are we as a church? Well, one thing is, let me remind you that in John chapter 1, the 14th verse, we are told, that, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And uh, I love the message of that. I, you've heard me quote this before in the time I've been here. But it's one of my favorite translations of a favorite verse. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. That's, that, that means that wherever you are, if Christ is in you, Christ is in the community in which you live. Woo, think of that. People are looking at you. <laughs> I just wondered what that was. Those of you who are watching, we're, we're getting a little reception somewhere, so that's okay. Now, let me, let me just remind you of this also. Heaven is a gated community. Wouldn't want to live in a gated community in St. Louis right now not a good place to be. But boy, heaven is a gated community. In fact, in the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter, we read the city, let me just, the city had a great high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. On the gates are written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. How'd you like to live in a in a city with an angel guarding the gate. Hey, we have a promise that that's where we can be. That's where we're headed. I like that. I like that notion. And in fact, let me read it a, a, a little further. The 13th verse says, there were three gates on the east and three on the north and three on the south and three on the west. Sounds like plenty of access to that gated community. And then from the uh, New Living Translation, <laughs> listen to this. On no, gate, on no day will its gates ever be shut. For there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it. No nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The cities of our country are a terrible place to be right now. Uh, Sixty-some consecutive, well, I think it's 60-something. If not, it's right at 60. Consecutive days of peaceful demonstrations in Portland, Oregon. And those peaceful, de uh, peaceful demonstrations have burned down a major section of that city. But Revelation's promises that Nothing impure will ever enter the New Jerusalem. Now, the church is also a community of covenant. 
the day of Pentecost was the day that the church was born. The, the, the day of Pentecost marked the beginning of Christian community that, that we read about where they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and, and they went on. Now, I, I, I looked up the word covenant. When I say that the church is a community of covenant, uh, a covenant is, according to the dictionary, a, a solemn agreement between the members of a church to act together in harmony with the precepts of the gospel. <laughs> did, you, did you realize you had agreed when you become part of this community to act in harmony? That's what the dictionary says you're supposed to do. And, you know, pretty good idea. And another way in which it, well, dictionary.com says, a community is a religious or other group sharing common characteristics or interests and perceived or perceiving itself as distinct in some respects from the larger society within which it exists. So let me just throw this in. Today we forget that we are distinctive as a community of believers. The day we decide we're just like everybody else is the day we lose a great part of what God wants us to be. I, I've already referred to it two or three times. But the first verse that I read today, verse 42 of the second chapter, says that in this community of covenant, they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves, let me read it again, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Four things to be devoted to. Does that help us? What does it mean to be devoted? Well, I look that one up too. To be devoted means to concentrate on a particular pursuit, occupation, purpose, cause, etc. I like the fact that they were devoted to four things, and I like all four of those things. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to fellowship. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could have some Oh, we do have fellowship even when we come together now. But there's no fried chicken. <laughs> um, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the first Church of the Nazarene in Los Angeles, uh, they had a practice that we've lost somewhere along the way. Their practice was that they had a potluck lunch together every Sunday. Hmm. Well, we've got the cement concrete in the floor, or for the floor, out there. It's coming, slowly. But it'll get there. See, the, is that the whole rest of the building out there? The rest of the building is out there. It just has to be brought from way, way, way over there and put the other side on. And I, and I know that, is the, is the new siding out there too yet? Not yet. The, we, we're going to have new siding on this, old, this older building. That's been ordered for a while. I don't remember exactly when it was ordered, but they said three weeks they'd have it here. So it'll be here before long. And then you can have fellowship every Sunday if you want. Well, they were not just devoted to fellowship. What kind of fellowship? Breaking of bread. <laughs> the last one is really, 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 really important. They're devoted. Yeah, let's look at the definition. 
Devoted means to concentrate on a particular pursuit. They were devoted to prayer. Let's hear that one. As we move forward, they uh, they moved out, and they did so many things to spread the news of Jesus Christ. Let me just quickly go through. I've got some slides about each of these things. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, what Jesus had taught the, the apostles, and he undoubtedly included the Old Testament, what Jesus had commanded them to do, and his last command was go and make disciples in all the nations. They were devoted to fellowship. Verse 44 and 45 says, and all who believe, and the Amplified New Testament said, says, I I like the, the Amplified, because it just kind of goes on and on and on about it, but here it is. All who believe, who adhere to and trusted in and relied on Jesus Christ, that kind of covers the waterfront, doesn't it? Were united, and together they had everything in common. They sold their possessions, both their land and property, and their movable goods, and distributed the price among all, according as they had need. The disciples focused on relationship. The, the Bible really knows nothing of solitary religion. It's been tough on all Christians to be a part. Hasn't it? Uh, and I know California, we don't live there, thankfully, but they now have the green. No churches meet again. Our home church in, in Illinois are making, they're making plans to start meeting again next Sunday for the first time. And they've got a limit on how many people can be in the auditorium, and a limit how many people can be at the fellowship hall, which is a big gymnasium, and not everybody's going to fit. But, and I, I, I saw on social media this week, people talking about, well, they're not going to keep me from meeting. Uh, God help us as we seek to to negotiate the tough waters of this day. I mean, if if Illinois says if I come to Wisconsin, I have to go back to Illinois and have two weeks of quarantine. I honestly don't know what I will do. I I know that some of you would say, well, just come. It'll be okay. God will take care of you. Yeah, he will. Before the, before the pandemic really got bad, before we really, it was really the very first part of the shutdown that we all experienced, uh, Sharon and I have some some good friends that are part of the Navajo Nation in Arizona. We had a number of Navajo students at Nazarene Bible College. And in fact, in the church that we attended and were members of, for the last several years that we were there, uh, one of the current Navajo pastors on the, uh, on the reservation I believe they're on the reservation in Arizona. It was our worship leader for a number of, of months, years. We have good friends there. Had several students there from there. They had a gathering before, before, before they were prohibited. It wasn't that they were being defiant. They had a gathering on a Saturday before all of the closures came about. Within a matter of weeks, dozens of individuals who had been at that service were positive that 
COVID test. A number of wonderful, nominal Christians have perished. There was a period of time when I checked frequently on the internet a newspaper called the Navajo Times. And I read a statement one time, and they said the spread of COVID-19 among the Navajo people is a result of that Church of the Nazarene meeting. So, will I come and cross the border if I need you to be here? I don't know. I want to do what God wants me to do. Um, the disciples focus not on what our rights are, as much as they focus on what does God want. And uh, they focused on being in relationship. They focused on being in community. They focused on the breaking of bread. At verse 47, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. They rejoice together. Okay, so again, the question, what difference does this make? The model of the early church should be our model. Okay, which for what church? That's what we're going to talk about, several of them. In Jerusalem and everywhere else, the model was that where the Holy Spirit was, there was community. Well, what does that mean? What difference does that make? Uh, a couple of questions. Who belongs to this community? Everyone. Well, who decides? The individual decides for themselves. You want to be a part of this community? Come on. You may not agree with everything. I've been amazed. Uh, we've had a couple of board meetings about furnishings in that new building out there. Uh, They've gone very smoothly. It could be that when the building's done, somebody, somebody from the congregation may walk in and say, oh my, why did they do this? <laughs> Let me assure you why they did that, because they thought it was what they should do. Okay. Simple. They thought that was the decision they needed to make. And each individual can decide for themselves in the community. But they must also be devoted to prayer, to the apostles' teaching, to outreach. When this is over, and it will be someday, maybe, when this is all over, we already know that it will be a very different world. So I have a couple of uh, things that I'd just like to say to all of you as a congregation, and you can pass the word to anybody who may not be watching or may not be here. This is just my suggestion, okay? Uh, keep this question before you. Is the decision we or I are about to make, or the action that we are about to take, moving us closer to our goal of being more of a community of God, or moving us farther away from that God. Okay, I took the banner out of here last week. 
brought it back in this morning. I bet I bought a camera. So I'll just run over here and get back in the camera. <laughs> Translate what I said up here with this. Let our decisions, our prayer, our fellowship, our, our community res resound with is the decision we're about to make or the action we're about to take, is it moving us closer to showing the love and compassion of Jesus Christ? Is it going to help us connect and care for the community? Or is it moving us away from that? Uh, Dan, here's another song to put into your uh, possibility for the next few weeks. There's a chorus that's been running through my mind as I have thought about all of this. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's peace. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is love. There is comfort in life's darkest hour. There is light and light. There is help and power in the Spirit in the Spirit of the Lord. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, Christian community breaks out. Let's pray that the Spirit would be with us in such full measure that we could be like the early church, whichever one we decide on. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth of your word that comes to us and speaks to us. Lord, help us to move through these days of test and trial with grace and the certainty that you are with us and then help us to find ways